Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon. Uh, can you all hear me? Great. Okay, I'm, I'm David Kretz. I'm a Germanist. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is the history and theory of translation. And there is a general consensus, I would say, in the literature on German translation studies um, that something changed in both in the practice of translation and the theory around the time frame indicated here, 1750 to 1830. Uh, in German studies, we call it the age of Goethe because it roughly coincides with his lifetime. And so the question I had, you know, what novel concepts of translation do emerge there? So the first question I had to ask myself, you know, what method to to use to go about this. Um, one approach you find that's that's been done is basically history of translation theory. Um, in German we call this Hünkampforschung. So basically what people do is they take the same major canonical theorists and read their very short statements and translation theory and do some sort of close reading or a philosophical reconstruction and analysis. Um, it's very repetitive and there's always a kind of um, arbitrariness to it, to my sense, in terms of, you know, which major theorist do you pick, why that theorist, um, and how, how are they connected. And on the other side, there are people who are interested in the practice of translation, who do all kinds of work in sort of, you know, history of translation, uh, book history, uh, and, and so on, um, to think about, you know, what was translated by whom, when, how. But these two approaches, as far as I'm aware, are not often brought together. And so my thought was to look at translator's prefaces as a literary form in its own right, as a kind of paratext um, that is also a site where the practice comes to some sort of understanding of itself or articulates its own self-understanding and to see what concept or concepts of translation do we find implicit in this literary form of the translator's preface um, as it emerges at that or, or develops at that historical moment. Okay, so there's, there's one study from the 60s that does that with a very small sample of around 50 or 60 translators' prefaces. There's a guy who just went to his library, said, okay, you know, I'm gonna take the translations from the shelf at my library, I'm gonna see whether they have prefaces. I'm gonna look at them, and the claim is sort of, you know, because it's fairly random, it should be representative. Um, but I think that's actually very questionable because it's a very small sample. And uh, what Knufman does, it's a bibliographical analysis of the, of the metadata. It's not a literary analysis of the form. So, um, you know, I asked where can we get a better sample from? There are a couple of existing databases here. There's the National Bibliography for the 18th Century, which is extremely comprehensive, but only goes up to 1800. Um, there are more specialized databases, such as the Heidelberg Translation Bibliography, or HIP, which covers the entire uh, time frame we're interested in, but only includes nonfiction texts and um, heavily biased towards French, Latin, and English. Um, doesn't really do much with minor languages. Um, so the thought was to build a new database uh, based on the so-called Messkataloge. They're the catalogs of the Leipzig and Frankfurt book fairs. They go back quite far in time and cover the entire uh, historical range we're interested in. There's two of them per year. There was a fair in the spring and in the autumn. Uh, these fairs still exist, um, actually. Um, it's interesting. Uh, they cover a wide range of genres and languages, so both um, you know, fiction, nonfiction, um, major and minor European and some non-European languages. Um, and they exist as PDFs, uh, 66,000 pages of them. And so I went and I downloaded all these PDFs. And I took it to Jeff Tharson from the Digital Studies Center to ask him what we can do with it. So beginning late last year, we undertook a project to OCR all of these. And you'll get to see examples of some of them in just a second. Uh, as far as we're aware, and it seems indeed that we are the first to convert the MES cataloga as they are into structured digital data. And what I mean by that is Unicode compliant plain text arranged by date. So we tested out several OCR systems and found that the Google Vision system actually performed the best. Uh, we'll see how that goes going forward. There are other research groups now involved, and uh, perhaps there will be an even better solution. Uh, but it did achieve about 95 to 98% accuracy, which was staggeringly good for us. Um, that said, as you'll see, there is still much work to be done with these sources. 
So here we have an example from 1595 on the right. This is Fraktur, hand gedrückt, printed uh, in Leipzig, and the plain text on the left. Uh, again, you'll notice it's only about 95 to 98% accuracy at best, but it did manage to capture some of the more interesting things within these uh, works. Here's an example from 1660. Once again, only about 95% accurate. And then from 1781, as you can see, the style of printing has changed radically over this time period, but the OCR system continued to perform at about the same level, and that was very comforting for us. So the data was far from perfect. Uh, there is an error rate here of about 2 to 5 percent, but we had 17.2 million individual tokens at that point. And we can start to build charts to look at the collections and the various key terms over time. Here are just a few samples. So this is the total tokens per year. You can see the obvious uh, the Easter catalogs tend to contain a slight bit more information than the Michael Messe, uh, and there is this clear trend of increasing numbers of works over time. You can also plot cities because, again, despite the small error rate, the way that uh, if you lowercase the entire collection and then look for specific engrams, you can build plots like this. Most interesting to us was, of course, that Halle was actually the number two uh, place mentioned in the Mess Cataloga in about 1750, and then it is very quickly eclipsed by Berlin. You can also do genres. Again, this is dirty OCR, but within about a 2 to 5 percent error rate, you can start to look at the development of various genres. Opera, in this case, probably just means Werke uh, works in, in aggregate. So for those who would like to explore these on your own, we have built a standalone interactive version of this Ngram viewer where you can put in any of the tokens or keywords that you'd like to look for. It runs in Python using Bokeh. They are all available right now on GitHub, and that's what the UI looks like. Okay, so we had this uh, digitized corpus. Um, these book catalogs, uh, you know, it's, it's a humongous amount of data to, to deal with, but basically, what I did to get back to the issue of translators' prefaces, I took nine catalogs from the full years, 1750, 60, and so on, until 1830, times when I'm interested in. I, I defined my search terms, uh, seven search terms. I got, went through them with a comp, found um, translations listed in these book catalogs. Uh, I kept it at 75 because I'm not interested in the sort of total absolute volume of translations, but in how the notion of translation changes over time here. Um, that resulted in 475 translations. Uh, then went onto Google Books quite simply or German library websites, found the scans, checked if they had a preface, downloaded them. So now we have 336 prefaces and going to start analyzing them. Um, so here, you know, old school, quite simply, read them all closely, uh, notice what formal features are recurring, uh, define a grid of 25 recurring formal features. And those can now be analyzed um, statistically, right? We can correlate those with genre, with source language, with um, gender and social class of the translator, uh, decade, and, and so on. Here, I, I gave you an overview of these features. There are some that concern just the general level of reflexivity in these prefaces. You know, is there a paratext reflecting on translation? Is it only on translation, written by the translator? What's the title? What's the length of the, the whole thing? Things about the translator that we can glean from the covers, often the name, their social position or class, are they nobility or clergy or from the bourgeoisie? Gender, is it one translator or several? Was there a collaboration involved? Um, we can look at the content. Does it contain descriptions of the translation, factual and normative evaluations? So, you know, is it accurate? Is it out of date in terms of, like, if it's a scientific treatise, for example? Uh, contextualization, you know, biographies, historical contextualization, and so on. And then you have, uh, in some of them, reflections on the very act of translation. Uh, the beginning of that act, uh, beginning with the philological establishment of the original, giving us the information and saying, you know, which cuts did they make before they translated, what did they add and why, um, the how of it. So, you know, what adjectives do they use to transcribe the translation? Do they discuss previous translation attempts? Where did they locate themselves historically, culturally, um, theory? 
You know, do they give definitions or examples? What do they mean by translating faithfully or freely? Uh, do they discuss examples? And then uh, these concluding gestures, which I think could be easily dismissed as rhetorical tropes, but are actually interesting when they offer certain apologies for their shortcomings of their translations or express certain hopes for further uh, improvements that, that often tells you quite a bit. So, you know, then I can, I can ask, you know, if we had like an ideal preface, um, something that had all these formal features, you know, what understanding of translation would be implicit in there? And I can find in my corpus some real examples that actually come very close and say, you know, I now know that these are kind of paradigmatic specimen to, to be looked at in more detail. And I can say, you know, which of these formal features predominate in which genres, what languages, what decades of the time frame I'm looking at. And another thing we want to do is just to use the same Angram viewer to see whether certain theoretical key terms um, actually circulate in the practitioner's discourse before the theorists coin them or make them, make them a central theoretical corner piece or whether the direction maybe goes the other way around, whether the practitioners read the theory and take up their terms and, and um, even, you know, let, let that guide their own practice. And that is kind of where we're at. So here we are and happy to take questions. Yeah.